welcome back to the Restoration Moment. Uh, we, I am Preacher Jimmy Butters. Uh, I am Preacher at Caledonia Church of Christ on the north end of the town of Caledonia. Uh, we'd love to have you come out 1030 on Sunday morning, 7 p.m. Sunday night. Uh, Bible study on, at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. Uh, also, we have our youth group uh, that meets the uh, uh, Soldiers for Christ meet on Thursdays, except for uh, this coming Thursday, uh, we will actually be working the food pantry out of K at Kirkpatrick. So uh, if you guys want to come out, we'd love to have you come out and check us out. Uh, loving, wonderful group of people. Uh, please come out and visit. Well, we are in the Bible book of the month of Leviticus, and uh, Leviticus is a fascinating book. It, it is the one that God speaks to his people more than any other book in the Bible. And in Leviticus, uh, there are some different laws that are laid out for uh, God's people, and these are what we call principles of godly living. And we see these things as... as you know, pictures of what we are supposed to be living like, to be God's people. And one of the things that I, that I found in Leviticus is the idea of leprosy. And I think in my mind I can, I can uh, qualify leprosy as being a picture of sin. So my title of my sermon is Leprosy is a Parable of Sin. And it's coming out of uh, Le Leviticus chapter 13, if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. And we will also be in 2 Kings today. But Le uh, Leviticus chapter 13, as we go into our focus today, is the idea of I'm forgiven. I am forgiven. This leprosy being a parable of sin is something that as God's holy people we need to really study and have a good understanding. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now this is a wise statement by the Apostle Paul. And Paul's statement begins my sermon today for a good reason. Today we're going to see that God has given us a picture or a parable of what sin looks like through His, old, his holy eyes. Now... A parable is interesting, and, and the way I've always kind of understood a parable to be, it is a parallel. It is an, a heavenly truth that is cast alongside of an earthly truth. So if it's true in heaven, it's true on earth. If it's true on earth, it's true in heaven. So when we study these parables, we want to look at what it is that God's showing us from the heavenly perspective so that we can understand it on the earthly perspective. Now, as we study our text, we're going to see several similarities between sin and this horrible disease of leprosy. And our first similarity, God has shown us how leprosy starts off small. It's a very small and, and minute spot, and it begins to grow. Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 2 says, When a man has on the skin of his body a swelling or a scab or a bright spot, and it becomes an infection of leprosy on the skin of his body. When he shall be brought to Aaron the priest and one of the sons of the priests. So uh, this idea of being a small spot, a blemish as it were. You know, humans were obsessive compulsive by nature. And remember that old Bugs Bunny, you know, cartoon? And Bugs would get into some kind of trouble and he'd look around and he'd say, If I do it. I'm going to get a whipping, right? And then a little bit later, he'd look around and he'd say, all right, I'm going to do it, right? He knows that he's got to get that done. It's, it's almost a deviant, you know, mindset within the nature that we live. You know, I've watched children growing up as, you know, my children were very small. Now they're grown, uh, 20 and 21 years old, and and. When my kids were little, I always noticed as these wonderful, beautiful kids, my darling daughter, who was just a precious moment when she was a baby. You know, we she grew up and had that beautiful little hair, little blonde haircut, and she was just as precious as could be. And we would take her in some place like my mom's house, and she'd have those china dolls, and and you know, Jenna would look around and you could almost see her eye, and she would just look up there and she would get ready to touch. And then she'd say, no, 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 and she'd stop herself, right? 
you know, but there's some kids that, you know, you, you put them in a China store and you see all this stuff is no, no touch. That's what we always said. And, and all of a sudden it becomes no, no touch. It's forbidden fruit. And I got to touch it, right? These are good kids. There's nothing wrong with them. They're normal. It's our way, it's our makeup. It's the way God made us is that, you know, if it's something we're not supposed to touch, we have to touch it. And that's what sin is like in the human. You know, we know as we, we tell a lie, what do you have to do to get out of a lie? Most likely you have to tell another lie, don't you? You know, this is how sin starts. It starts off very small and it begins to get bigger and bigger. And eventually you're telling lie after lie after lie to get yourself out of what, you know, was very something small if you would have just told the truth. We see things in situations in lives uh, with sexual Im immorality. You know, we have something that starts off with, you know, seeing a, a TV show or, you know, watching something maybe on, on a billboard. You can't even walk, drive down a road now without seeing billboard with half-naked women on it, you know. Red-blooded American man, you know, he sees that and it makes, makes us want to do stuff, you know, that we wouldn't normally do, right? Well, now you got this thing called the internet and you have to watch your children constantly. Why? Because they get on there and they can see anything that they want to see. And it started off as just an image on the side of the road. And eventually it begins to lead down a path that is destructive. That's what sin is like. Folks, you know, snowballs start off as something small. By the end of the mountain, they're boulders. And that's what sin does in the life of, of a Christian, especially. Second similarity we see in how leprosy and sin affects our lives. Uh, look at Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 5. Chapter 13 and verse 5. It says, And the priest shall look at him on the seventh day, and on his eyes the infection is not changed, and the infection is not spread on the skin. Then the priest shall isolate him for seven more days. And the priest shall look at him again on the seventh day, and if the infection is faded, the mark is not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scab in which you can wash in his clothes, and he'll be clean. But if the scab proceeds farther on the skin and has been shown himself to the priest and the cleansing, he shall appear again to the priest, and the priest shall look, and if the scab is spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It's leprosy. You know, and somebody who was dealing with something unclean, they had to be taken out of the fellowship. They were taken out of the fold. You know, today's world, we live in a nation, folks, that is supposed to be tolerant, right? You know, we're above all this kind of thing, aren't we? Setting people aside and, you know, maybe having leprosy camps, you know, where they would, they would put these people out in leper colonies and, and segregate them from society. Well, we live in, a, in this tolerant nation, supposedly, that just wants to let the sin walk boldly within the regular public. You know, we have a nation that just had a president that would allow us to have men go into the women's room with little girls. You know, they just walk boldly wherever they want to go. These people are perverts. Well, folks, that is not the way God has set things up. And we in the church have to be very conscious of this because if we have sin that's, right, that's uh, running rampant in the church, we cannot let it go. We must do as God has said and separate them from fellowship. Now, I'm not saying that you, you kick them out and they're never allowed to come back, but you say, look, you're not allowed to have communion with us until you've repented and show fruit of repentance. You know, God has laid this out within the structure of the Bible. Leviticus chapter 13, verse uh, 45 and 46 says, As for a leper who has the infection, his clothes will be torn, and his hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean all the days in which he has had the infection, and he is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. God has set this as a standard for his people. 
to be holy. When God looks down at that small little blemish, it's not blemish to him. It's ugly and disgusting. You know, folks, we as, as a church, we want to be tolerant. We want to love people, but we cannot be tolerant to the point where we allow sin to run rampant in our churches. We have to stand firm and explain to people, we're not going to let you, you know, defile what it is that God has made clean. We as Christians must be willing to love people to the cross and we must love them for who they are. But we must be willing to also say, hey, you know, if sin's crouching at our door, we, we need to put a stop to it right away. You know, we love you, but we don't want you to be in our fellowship if you're going to be sinning against God. We don't want you taking communion with God until you have repented and you've changed your ways. You've turned back. You know, when the person has repented, Paul says that we should bring them back and we need to forgive. And that's one of the big things that many churches, you know, we're okay with kicking people out and that's all right. But we forget that when they've repented and they've sufficiently shown, you know, the grace and the fruit of repentance, they're supposed to be let back in. And that's where as, as Christians, we have to be tolerant and we have to understand, you know, that person's sin is forgiven. Just as much as the sin was forgiven the day we entered into the watery grave of baptism, their sin is forgiven. And we as a church must at that point look back and say, look, they've stopped the sin, they've repented, and it's time to let them back in. God has commanded this. So we got to be careful with that. Third similarity we see of the leper is to what they should do to be clean again. In the case of the leper, God had left a way out. Uh, first, he must go to the priest, be pronounced clean. And then, uh, you know, we as Christians would look at Jesus being our high priest. We go to him to be pronounced clean. And uh, God has shown us uh, a picture of this becoming clean and, and how to go about doing it. And we see this in 2 Kings chapter 5. There was a man by the name of Naaman. And uh, Naaman was a captain. Uh, chapter 5 verse 1 of the armies of the king of Aram. And was a great man with his master and highly respected because, of, uh, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. And the man was also a valiant warrior. But he was a leper. He was a mighty man of God. But, or a mighty man of valor. But he was a leper in this particular situation. So uh, the king had asked for the king of Israel to help him out. Look in verse 6. It says, He brought a letter to the king of Israel saying, And now as the, the letter comes to you, behold, I have set name in my servant to you, and that you may cure him of his leprosy. And it came about when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill uh, to kill and to make alive. This man is uh, sending word to me to cure a man with his leprosy. But consider now as he is seeking the quarrel against me. And having Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of, of Israel had torn his clothes and he sent to him a uh, word to him saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me and he'll know that there is a prophet in Israel. And Naaman came and sent and his him and his horses, his chariots, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you should be clean. Naaman was furious and went away, but thought, Surely come out, he would come out to me and, and stand and call on the name of his Lord his God and wave his hand over me. You know, he wanted a big spell, you know, something grand to happen. He says, you gonna make me go wash in the river. And his servant came near to him, verse 13, and says, spoke to him and said, Father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more is it that he says to wash and be clean? And he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River. You know, seven times. He didn't do it six. He did it the seven. And according to the word, the, God, the man of God, his flesh was restored like a little child. He was clean. See, the fact is, God has given us this picture in the New Testament as well. These men who had killed Jesus came to them, came to Peter. And, and the men 
and said, you know, we realize we killed the Messiah. They were pierced to the heart. He said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness of your sin. Now, folks, this is what the Bible has laid out for us to be sinners become clean. And as Christians, we can do this. We must be baptized for the forgiveness of our sin. Not because of the forgiveness of our sin, but for the forgiveness of our sin, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. The Apostle Paul also tells us why, how this works. He says, therefore, Romans chapter four, uh, 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might too walk in newness of life. Folks, Naaman was like a newborn baby. He was given all that he needed to be clean again. This is what the Bible pictures for us when we're baptized in the watery grave of baptism. That we take on the blood of Christ and we're given forgiveness of our sin. That blemish is no longer there. Our high priest has cleansed us. He's cleaned us for good. And then all we have to do is repent shortly after that if we have problems again. So what do we learn today? We see that God has given us a parable of what sin does to mankind and how it affects us and how it looks, how ugly it is. God showed us that leprosy is so small. It just begins with just a small groan and it grows into something large and ugly and distorted. God showed us how leprosy or sin affects our lives. It, it takes us out of fellowship with Him. He's showed us a picture of you know, how sin has taken us away from being in the presence of God. He cannot be holy and be in the presence of sin. So we take on the blood of Christ. We wash ourselves in the watery grave of baptism to rise and walk in newness of life. And God showed us what a leper or a sinner can do to be clean. That's it. That's all you have to do. And folks, the Bible says, once you have heard the word, you can believe the word, confess Jesus as Lord. You've repented sufficiently. And you entered into the watery grave of baptism. You're forgiven. You've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. God dwells inside of you again. But he says there's another thing you got to do. We have to live life. It's the beginning of a walk, not the end of the journey. So pray with me. Father, I give you praise. I give you glory. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gift of your son on the cross. Let us be thankful in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Day evening to everyone out there. I hope you've had a good Sunday, the Lord's Day. And I hope that uh, you have been able to attend the church. Um, but if you haven't, uh, we'd like for you to invite you to take communion with us this evening. The Bible book of the month is Leviticus. And one striking feature about Leviticus that has to be with this Lord's Supper has got to be what they call the Day of Atonement. It's found in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, and verses 20 through 22. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. He shall bring the live goat. Now they had two goats in this celebration. One of them was sacrificed, but they left one alive. And this live goat was called, is called commonly by us today, the scapegoat. And you'll see why as we read on here. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat 
and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness and the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto a land uninhabited and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness now, there are many analogies to be drawn from this ritual of the scapegoat and uh, preacher Jimmy will mention some of these I'm sure but there's one that I've thought of this was done once a year in would be our month of October and it is called the day of atonement atonement means a covering or a hiding uh, the sins of the people were covered and hidden from God but those sins in the Old Testament were just rolled ahead they were not obliterated done away with completely they were rolled ahead for a year and the next year the people met them again as more sins were laid on the head of the scapegoat so you see the sins of the people mounting up and mounting up and mounting up for 1500 years they mounted up and they were all waiting for one thing and that was the perfect sacrifice of Jesus and he bore those sins on the night before he died we are told that he was in such anguish that his sweat was like great drops of blood splattering on the ground was it the physical pain of the crucifixion that he dreaded was it the seeming injustice that the perfect man should pay the price for us all was it the fact that his beloved ones here on earth would witness this ignominious sacrifice all these must have tormented his mind but I think the one thing that tore at his soul the most was that the father at this point would have to turn his back on him because he could not stand to look at the sins that were heaped upon his own son's perfect head. Matthew 27 verse 46 says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic, for my God, <clears throat> my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That goat was led outside the camp, and then he was let go. There to face the privations of the wilderness, the blistering heat, the hunger, the thirst, and oh yes, the predators and that lone goat out there in the wilderness I'm certain did not survive as he was let go he who had been eternally in perfect union with God now alone 
against the forces of everything that is unholy. Do not think, never think that God just wrote off these sins because of what Jesus willingly did. No. God must remain just and he must remain holy. The sins must be paid for in full. Even Jesus asked if there was any other way. In the days of Noah, God simply wiped the earth clean and began again. But Jesus loves us. <laughs> Jesus loves me this, I know. For the Bible tells me so. And he concluded his request to God with, not my will, but thine. And then he turned his face toward the cross and he never looked back. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. people had built up and my sin today the sins that I have committed and the sins that I will commit tomorrow because I am not able to be a perfect person I thank you for this sacrifice it is in this alone that I trust to make me right in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.